Hi, everybody, and welcome to NASA Spaceflight. I'm Matt Anderson, and I'm filling in as host this week. In this Cape Flyover episode, we'll take a look at the future of SpaceX's Starship in Florida, which may be a little bit different than we thought. We'll also highlight some exciting hardware we spotted over at Blue Origins Pad, and check out what's going on over at NASA's SLS as it prepares for the first human flight to the moon in over 50 years. Not bad. Let's start off with Sawyer overviewing the latest on SpaceX's launch and recovery facilities. Hey Matt, on our last flyover, we mentioned that things were pretty quiet over at SpaceX's facilities at the Cape, especially compared to Blue Origin. Well, we saw your comment saying, I take that personally. And honestly, it's understandable, since SpaceX is at its highest launch cadence so far. In fact, since that flyover, SpaceX has launched eight times from the Cape. But one big question remains. One Starship-sized question remains. At 39A, where the Starship launch pad had been built, there's been a whole lot of nothing major. If you tune into our Space Coast live stream, you probably could see lifts and some small cranes around it from time to time, and we, in fact, captured that during this flyover. So while it might not look like a lot, they're definitely still working on it. But hey, at least the good news is, it's not totally abandoned. SpaceX is probably doing as much as they can here at 39A with what they've learned so far at Starbase. Maybe they're waiting to see the new water-cooled steel plates work in action before going ahead and installing them at 39A. Now if we just slide to the left. Everybody clap your head. Oh, no, wait, that's a copyright issue. <laughs> anyway, next to the Starship Tower at 39A, we can see crews working to modify the Falcon Transporter Erector from Falcon 9 configuration to Falcon Heavy. The launch pad supported the launch of the CRS-28 resupply mission to the ISS just a few weeks ago. And up next is the launch of the classified USSF-52 mission. That Falcon Heavy launch will feature a double booster landing back at the Cape. At Slick 40, work on the crew access tower foundations continues. It seems kind of slow, right? Well. It's rather hard to do any work if rockets are launching every five or six days. That being said, on those days in between, they're still working on it. And heck, we could even be a few weeks away from seeing the first segments start rising. Actually, about that whole launch cadence thing, while we were flying, we saw the next Falcon 9 that was set to fly. We spotted more SpaceX hardware as well at Port Canaveral. A rare sight these days, most of SpaceX's fleet was at dock. Shannon and Megan, both Dragon recovery vessels, are awaiting the return of the CRS-28 Dragon capsule from the ISS in just a few weeks. That's where one of the two ships will lift it out of the water and eventually bring it back to land. Teams appear to be moving around a mock-up of a Dragon capsule that is normally used during recovery training. Multi-purpose logistics vessel Bob was also at port after supporting booster recovery operations for the CRS-28 mission. Its twin vessel, Doug, headed out earlier this week, tugging SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas to support booster and fairing recovery for that Satria mission. A common sight these days is the presence of not one, but two uh, 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 boosters at the port. B-1073, which had supported the launch of Starlink Group 5-11, was standing tall on Just Read the Instructions, all while recovery operators prepared to transport B-1077 back to the refurbishment facility for its next flight. By the way, you might notice a strange difference in these boosters. Take a look. One of them, B-1077, has the Falcon 9 logo, while the other doesn't. Why is it? It's because B-1073 is slated to fly as a Falcon Heavy side booster in the not too distant future. And of course, with SpaceX, it's purely for aesthetics. Pretty neat. Do you know what's neat? Especially about those Falcon Heavy boosters? The double landings. We all love them, right? Heck, I've seen it a few times in person and it never gets old. That booster in particular will actually be part of the first double drone ship landing. For that, it will need to ignite its engines three times. The launch, entry burn, and landing burns. But wait, which goes in which order and which engines are fired? If only there was a shirt at shop.nasaspaceflight.com that explained it. Well, what do you know? 
There's our launch, entry, and landing collection. If you were to look at the rocket engines while it's horizontal on the pad, these are the exact engines that would ignite in this precise layout. Now, I should say Alex wrote this neat fact just because he likes precision. Now, if you're not as nerdy as him, his words, not mine, you can still just grab it in commemoration of the 200th landing of a Falcon booster just about a week ago. There's even more to look at with SpaceX, including Robert's Road. But before we head there, let's head over to Blue Origins campus and Adrian with what we saw from them. Adrian? Thanks, Sawyer. During our last flyover, we were spoiled by the amount of hardware that we spotted at Blue Origins Exploration Park facilities. Things were a bit quieter this time, but that's probably not a bad thing. As you may remember, last time we spotted a New Glenn upper stage tank in the 2CAD facility. But this time, the door is closed. This could mean that the tank is currently going through testing in a closed environment. Or maybe the tank finished its testing process and has been removed from 2CAD. We can't be sure, but maybe we'll get a clue in our next flyover. The same goes for the tank we saw in TCAT. The door to the building was closed this time, so sadly we didn't get a look at any hardware. Toward the southern end of the campus, we see Blue making more progress with the newer facilities. At the vertical assembly area, we captured an interesting stand inside of the structure. It's hard to guess what this could be without knowing what the purpose of this building is yet, but this has definitely made us curious about the possibility of seeing more hardware out and about. Reef Pathfinder building now has a large door. Given the size of this door, it's likely that this building will support some pretty serious hardware and pair that with the name of this building, we hope to see some early hardware for Orbital Reef rolling around in the near future. At Launch Complex 36, we were lucky enough to capture the full New Glenn transporter erector laying horizontal at the pad. While this isn't the first time we have seen the TE at the pad, there appears to be some extra hardware attached to it. The most interesting part of this is the circular structure with a hexagonal cutout in the middle. My writer says that this looks like the structure from the movie Contact, but as you can probably guess, I have no clue what that means. The diameter of the structure appears to be 9 to 10 meters, the same as New Glenn's engine section. The hexagonal cutout also is similar to what New Glenn's engine section has. What do you think this could be? Let us know in the comments below. Also new is what appears to be a stand for New Glenn first stage tanks at the Glenn Stage 1 test area just east of the launch pad. This area was first noted in updated site plans submitted in early 2022. While it's not completely clear what this area will be used for, we assume that it could be used to cryotest the tanks on New Glenn's first stage. To back this up, NOAA aerial image from February 2023 shows that there are propellant lines running to this area from the launch pad. We look forward to seeing tests beginning here in the near future. At the launch and landing facility, work continues on the large-scale expansion happening in the area. The most notable change in this flyover is the structure being erected for the payload processing facility, or PPF, at the site known as Project Comet. As we have mentioned in previous videos, the customer for this project is currently anonymous. But stay tuned for any updates on that in our future videos once we'll find out we'll be operating here. To the north of Project Comet's land, clearing and preparation continues for the northern areas known as Block 1 Site 2. Once the site is finished being cleared, we can expect to see some more progress with it being prepared for future customers, hopefully for something like this. Back to you, Sawyer. Thanks, Adrian, but you're kind of making me look bad here. With everything Blue is doing, I feel kind of awkward now talking about Robert's Road. Since the last flyover, everything has pretty much been abandoned. We already pointed out last time how material for the Florida Mega Bay had disappeared and one of the big cranes had been disassembled. Well, if you haven't watched our Starbase update videos, and if you have, you're really cool for doing that, keep it up, you probably missed that all of that equipment has now moved to Starbase. Does that mean Starship from Florida will never happen? I highly doubt that. As I mentioned earlier, we're still seeing activity at the Starship pad at 39A. While SpaceX had abandoned the work on the tower segments, the Mega Bay, chopsticks, and other Starship-related hardware, they were still outfitting this building, and now you can even see air conditioning units on its roof. But why? It's possible that building might not be for Starship anymore, at least for now. 
There's some evidence that SpaceX is using it now to integrate payloads for Falcon 9, and in particular, for Starlink missions. Earlier this month, we saw the fairing with satellites for the Starlink Group 6-4 mission passing in front of our Space Coast Live cameras by the Vehicle Assembly Building. Here, check out this map. SpaceX's main payload processing facility is located at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, just a mile southwest from Slick 40. So if the fairing with payload had been processed there, then it shouldn't have needed to pass in front of the VAB. So what other location does SpaceX own near the VAB that they could be using for this kind of processing? That's right, the previously known as Star Factory Building. I guess it needs a new name. For now, we're going to call it Hangar X-2, with Hangar X-1 being the other building on the east at Roberts Road. That's used for booster and fairing refurbishment. So, no Starship factory, no Starship assembly, but the pad is still being worked on? Uh... Well, I guess it's time to revisit the theory we brought up on the last flyover, where we mentioned the rumors about SpaceX receiving the lease of High Bay 1 at the VAB. Under this assumption, SpaceX could, in theory, build full vehicles at Starbase's factory, ship them to the Cape, and outfit them for flight inside of the Vehicle Assembly Building. This theory makes more sense now that we know there's probably not going to be fabrication of Starship vehicles for a while at KSC. Well, we know for certain of one vehicle being worked on in the VAB, so I'm going to send it back to Matt for an update on SLS. Now, it's not only Starship pad hardware being worked on over at the Kennedy Space Center. We're also seeing progress on the preparations for NASA's Artemis II mission scheduled for next year. Over a beautiful LC-39B, we can see air vaporizers staged next to that big old liquid hydrogen sphere, brand new and set to debut on this mission. Now this tank will upgrade the hydrogen capacity of the pad, allowing NASA's hungry orange rocket to be recycled more quickly after any potential launch aborts laid into the count. Work on the pad emergency egress landing area seems to be nearing completion. Now this is where astronauts would slide down to from the launch tower in the event of an emergency on the pad. You can even see the numbering of each astronaut there from one to four. Meanwhile, near the VAB, work is almost wrapped up in upgrading the Mobile Launcher 1, or ML1, ahead of Artemis 2. The new Rainbird nozzles for the Deluge system appear to have been installed, and some of the umbilical plates on the quickness connect arms of the tower have been reinstalled after refurbishment. Once all work is complete, the ML1 should roll back to LC-39B to conduct testing of the upgraded systems and allow workers to also test the newly installed pad emergency egress system we mentioned before. Near the ML1 is the ongoing servicing of the Crawler Transporter 2 that will move the platform out to the pad for testing. We can also see groundwork in progress at the East Park site to begin assembly of the base platform structure of the Mobile Launcher 2, or ML2. The ML-2 will be used to support the larger SLS Block 1B rocket, and pieces for it have already arrived at KSC, and will continue to do so over the next few years. While we see the construction of the ML-2, the old Shuttle Mobile Launch Platform 3 is undergoing demolition at the old Apollo Mobile Service Structure Park site. It's sad to see this piece of history going, but as the saying goes, out with the old and in with the new. Now, the saying is probably very on point with what Adrian is overviewing, so Adrian, take it away. At ULA Space Launch Complex 41, the pad was empty following the exciting and successful static fire of Vulcan's two BE-4s on June 7th. There are still some steps left before we will see Vulcan fly, but if you want more info on that, check out our latest episode of This Week in Spaceflight. Moving down to Space Launch Complex 37B, we can see the amazing looking Delta IV Heavy stacked inside the mobile service tower ahead of its upcoming NRL 68 mission. This will be the second last launch of Delta IV Heavy, before it's retired in favor of Vulcan. At Relativity's Launch Complex 16, we spotted some excavators moving dirt around at the northern side of the pad. And there's a good reason for that. Relativity has submitted plans ahead of upgrading the pad of Terran R. These plans almost exactly match the renderings that Relativity shared with us back in April. New additions include a launch pad and hangar properly sized for Terran R, upgraded propellant storage, two flare stacks and more. We'll definitely have a front row seat to this construction as we continue to bring you more flyovers. Well, it looks like the Cape is full of activity. And while SpaceX's plans for Starship here may have changed, we still have lots of launches coming up to look forward to. And it's exciting progress from Blue Origin finally nearing the pad after all these years of waiting. So with that in mind, we'll leave you with a question. Which rocket will fly first from Florida, New Glenn 
or Starship. And choose wisely, because we'll be checking back in with you in a few years. And if you're a fan of Rocket Rivalries and you need more locks for your next passionate Discord argument, then consider watching this video from Adrian, featuring both Starship and Blue Moon in the Battle of Lunar Landers. You can also check out our latest Starbase update to get up to speed on what's going on over there. Well, that's all from the Space Coast. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.